you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. Chris Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvoss.com. Hey, we've got an amazing author on the show today. Uh, you're gonna, your mind's gonna be blown at what you're gonna learn today, and you're gonna learn so much stuff. You know, you're gonna be more sexy to uh, all the people in your life. They're just gonna be like, you have this glow of intelligence and sexiness that just em- emulates off you. Is emulate the right word? I don't even know what I'm talking about. We improv the ramble every time, folks. You have been here for the last 13 years. That's what we do. We try and make something funny. Sometimes it's funny. Sometimes it's stupid. And sometimes the stupid is funny. I don't know what it means. Anyway, guys, welcome to the show. Uh, we have the newest book that's coming out November 15, 2022, Personality and Power, Builders and Destroyers of Modern Europe. Uh, we're going to be talking about this amazing book today, History. The most important thing you can learn about history is the or let's see, what's my old saying? The one thing man can learn about his history is that man never learns about his history. Thereby, we just keep repeating it. So you want to learn history so that you don't keep repeating it, people. Let's try and do that one of these decades, centuries, years, uh, the folly of man, if you will. Uh, in the meantime, you know the drill. Go to goodreads.com for chess Chris Voss to see everything we're reading and reviewing over there. Go to our groups on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, youtube.com for chess Chris Voss. You see everything that's going on there. For the show to your family, friends, and relatives as well. Ian Kershaw is on the show with us today. He is the leading disciple of German historian Martin Rochat. And until his retirement, he was a professor at the University of Sheffield. He's also a sir. He's been knighted by the Queen. So uh, we want to pay him some oh, uh, 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 some uh, ultra respect, just in case, I don't know, uh, Britain decides to invade us. Uh, we don't want that happening. Uh, Kershaw was named, uh, or was called, uh, or Kershaw has called Borchat an inspirational mentor who did much to shape his understanding of Nazi Germany. He served as a historical advisor on numerous BBC documentaries, notably The Nazis, A Warning from History, and War of the Century. He taught a module titled Hit- Germans Against Hitler. Uh, he was born in 1943. He's an English historian whose work has chiefly been focused on social history of the 20th century Germany. He's regarded as many of one of the world's leading experts on Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany, and is particularly noted for his biographies of Hitler. Welcome to the show, Ian. How are you? Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Yes, I'm very well. Thank you. There you there you go. It's wonderful to have you. And hey, uh, America, we just voted over here, and uh, we took a step away from fascism. Are you proud of us? I thought it was a good result. Yes, I don't like to comment too much on the internal politics of another country, but we are very quietly pleased with what happened last night. Yeah, yeah. I, all of my friends have been writing me around the world, going, "What the hell's going on over there? What drugs are you on?" And of course, it's fentanyl. So there, there you go. Uh, so, Ian, uh, I, I, I understand you don't have some uh, placards on the internet, but uh, let's plug your book. Where can we find your book? Um, well, I'm watching it. Available on Amazon or wherever, I, um, should be at all good bookshops soon, I suppose. The usual, usual. There you, go. you sound like you're not really sure. You don't trust those book publishers to put it on Amazon. <laughs> Maybe you don't care. Well, I just leave it to them. Yes, they want. You're like I got paid. If they want to sell it on Amazon, go ahead. Anyway, we're just being funny here. So, Ian, what motivated you want to write this book? You've written a lot of books. How many books have you written, and what motivated you to write this book? Uh, how many books? Two or sixteen. There you go. But um, anyway, what I, why I decided to write this book was that I'd, I'd written two two um, lengthy books in the preceding few years on the history of Europe in the twentieth century, and all the people who figure in the characters who figure in this book were, of course, in those two volumes. But those are sort of panoramic histories of of Europe, and I didn't have that much time to deal with the individuals. Um, in sufficient depths, I decided in the end that I'd write a book which looked at the 20th century 
through the impact of these individuals. And I chose 12 European individuals uh, to focus on. And uh, the book arose from that background, really. Nice. And uh, so what can we learn from history? What was, what was the... Uh... What was the scope of the book? Uh, give us some uh, in-depth story. You cover Churchill. Uh, who are some of the other leaders that you cover in the book? Well, I, I take it really through the centuries. So start with Lenin, Lenin, mm -hmm. Lenin, Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, Churchill, De Gaulle, and then on to the post-war mm -hmm. era. Aznar, the leader of West Germany in the immediate post-war era. Uh, Franco, the Spanish dictator. Mm -hmm. uh, Tito, the Yugoslavian leader. Margaret Thatcher, uh, the one woman in the, in the book, uh, uh, then, uh, Gorbachev and finally the German chancellor of the 1980s and nineties, Helmut Kohl. Wow. Now you, you, yeah. the title of the book is personally empower builders and destroyers of modern Europe in the scope of that. And the leaders that you profiled were, they, did you profile them as builders and destroyers? Or some of these folks were builders and some of these folks were destroyers? Well, some were obviously destroyers. I um, think mm -hmm. no further than Hitler in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, some were builders, and you can speak of um, maybe the West German leader, Adenauer, in the same country, but the Adenauer then built West Germany from scratch, really, after, 19, after 1945. Um, and, um, and some were builders and destroyers. So if you want, you can look at uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet leader, the last Soviet mm -hmm. leader, who um, was a builder of Europe in certain ways, um, gave many millions of people in Central and Eastern Europe freedom, and yet destroyed his own country. So a builder and a destroyer. So each of the three categories figures, I think, elders, destroyers, and both builders and destroyers. There you go. One thing I learned about leaders whether it's a CEO, I, I, I learned about a lot about leadership and CEOs um, and, and builders and destroyers. And uh, one thing I learned is there were some leaders that they have a penchant to be able to really uh, build, grow things and design things, but they also have a very destructive dark side. Steve Jobs had a dark side. Um, I imagine a lot of the people you uh, talked about in the book, uh, you know, there's the, there's kind of that light side where they're that great leader, great builder, but there's kind of a destruction that almost a destructive sort of, uh, landscape or hurricane that rides behind them in the darkness of, of their personalities that almost sometimes seems to overtake them. They seem to stay one step ahead of it, or sometimes it does overtake them. Is that a good analogy? Uh, yes, I think it is. Um, I, obviously, uh, in this book, I, I, uh, go a lot into the preconditions of leadership and crisis is the is a current that runs right through the book. So each of these leaders is a product of crisis. And crisis produces different sorts of leaders. And some of them have um, a dark side, which is subordinate to a positive side, you might say. Someone like uh, Churchill, for instance, we could put it that way. Um, others uh, have obviously a prominent and totally mm, comprehensive dark side, which is to their absolutely to the fore right from the beginning. Well, that's the way we see it uh, historically. At the time, of course, people with what you might call a dark side uh, themselves might be very appealing to large numbers of people, given the nature of the crisis that they're facing. And so what works in one society doesn't work in the other. But what you can say is that each of these individuals has particular leadership characteristics, which are not common to every individual. And those characteristics, an instinct, power, lust for power, um, determination, and so on, many other characteristics, which are often very negative ones, uh, can be very positive in a particular com set of conditions for the audience that, that um, is uh, being appealed to. There you go. So did, did you find that a lot of these personalities had consistent traits? Were they, um, we, you know, did some people really think maybe at the beginning of their run, they were trying to do the right thing, say maybe Stalin or someone, they, they were like, you know, I'm trying to do the right thing, trying to build a better company, and then or better, you know, country, and then, uh, and then, you know, the, the, whatever their narcissism overwhelms them or, or they think they're doing good and they, and they end up not, even though, uh, they think they're trying to do the right thing. Well, someone like Stalin or Hitler, um, they, they, um, 
they, of course, they had ideals for what the new society was they were attempting to build, but the negative side was always built into that as well. So right from the beginning, the uh, negativity, the, um, the, the exclusion of enemies of that stage or enemies of that people was very prominent in their appeal. And it was a very successful part of their appeal, given the nature of the crisis that they faced at the time. People bought into that, the fact that they wanted to destroy as well as to build. Yeah, there's there's a real destruction quality, and it's really interesting how they st- they seem to stay ahead of it. Like Steve Jobs was was you know a, a, most people found out about his dark side after he passed, and and you know books are written about uh, what a jerk he was. <laughs> Some people kind of knew it that worked with him as he was going, but uh, um, you know th- th- there's this revereness that people have, uh, almost hero worship people have to some of these leaders. And they don't know the dark side. Like uh, an example might be, might be Hitler, where uh, a lot of German people either turned a blind eye or didn't understand how, how much uh, horror he was uh, committing. And uh, when they when we liberated uh, Nazi Germany, you know they made the uh, German people watch the videos of of the Holocaust and the fallout from the, from all the stuff they did, and you know made them. Uh, be educated on on what Hitler had done, and then some of the shine, yeah, I'm sure, came off of their minds that maybe Hitler wasn't that great of a guy for them. Well, just a couple of um, a couple of uh, remarks um, about Hitler, which your comments have just uh, stirred in me. One is that um, in free elections before he came to power, Hitler never won the majority support of the German people. So um, the the most that he won was in 1932, where just over a third of the German people supported him. Mm. So once he got into power then, of course, the scope was available for him to extend this hold on power by destroying his enemies, political enemies, first of all, first and foremost, um, and by, by um, repression and by monopoly control of the media, he was able to create this image for himself that of the supreme leader of the, of the almost deified image. Mm. And that... The other dictators as well, that once they have power, they're able to have a monopoly control of the mass media to build up this glorious image of themselves mm. with a completely fabricated image. Um, so uh, we have to bear that in mind. And then um, also the, the process which develops then a radicalizing process that people in the, in the early 1930s in Germany were fully aware the Nazi party was an anti Semitic party. But mm. that didn't them from voting for it because they saw the Jews as part of the crisis of the, of the part of the evil that they faced in their own society. Right. Completely, complete lunacy, of course. It was not that mm-hmm. at all. But that, yeah. that the image which they had, it didn't deter anybody from voting Nazis at that time who uh, supported generally the aims that Hitler stood for. Later on, of course, the radicalization of those policies then led to the Holocaust. And so once that, after the war, people were only too keen to distance themselves from the horrors which were now being brought home to them and which they realized had taken place uh, with in their, in, in their own, but by their own government, with them supporting large parts of what that government seemed to stand for. Yeah, you'd think that we would have learned over time that politicians, you know, going back eons of time, have always played that game with usually the immigrant. You know, they're like, that new person over there who just showed up, yeah, they're the person who's stealing from you. Meanwhile, they're, you know, they're picking the pockets of everybody who's looking over there uh, yeah. and stealing from them. And we, we don't seem to learn this lesson. You know, the, 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 the thing you're talking about where people create this false image and the scorious leadership and it becomes this cult of personality, it rings really true of what's going on here in America. Um, you write about, uh, you write about uh, Mussolini. And one of the things that's been echoing through our brain over here in America mm-hmm. as doing this voting in 2022 is, um, are people willing to give up capitalism for the trains to run on time? Because that was the big thing about fascism. Well, fascism, people are bad and there's some grift, but the trains run on time. The economy works. And that's, I think with Hitler, you know, they wanted the economy to work. They were in, they were in a bad economy, especially from the post-war, uh, World War One fallout. Uh, same with Mussolini. And so, you know, people in these, in these situations are willing to say, well, if, you know, if we can have jobs and we can have the trains run on time, we'll give up some freedom. 
and then it becomes a slippery slope. That's exactly right. And um, they, which we're seeing in, in, of course, today with populist leaders today that um, yeah. the readiness to, to um, give them support and to put them in positions of power without any possibility then of controlling what they do once they're in power. So it's a very dangerous, yeah. very dangerous trend. And yeah. um, that's uh, in, in the 1920s and 1930s when democracy was far flimsier than it is today then it was even more dangerous and you gave then scope that Hitler, one of his speeches, I remember in 1932, 40,000 people there assembled for one of his open air speeches. And he, he said very openly, I'm going to destroy democracy. I'm going to sweep it away, sweep all the parties away. And the crowd cheered like mad. Uh, wow. So that was a very popular message, you see. And as you said, the notion that somebody will put things to put things right for you in the depths of a crisis, some great hero will come along and put things right for you, will we'll rescue the nation. It's a very dangerous message. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Hi, folks. Here's Foz here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, uh, I think I can offer a wonderful breadth of information information and knowledge to you or anyone that you want to invite me to for your company. Thanks for tuning in. We certainly appreciate you listening to the show and be sure to check out Chris Voss leadership Institute.com. Now back to the show. Uh, would it was Pinochet a consideration for this book? It seems like he would be a good addition, but you know, you, you, you only have so much time to write and size. Would Pinochet have been a good, uh, add to this book or. Yes, it could have been. And, and so were, so would other non-European leaders, I, mm -hmm. I really wrestled with these thoughts for quite some time. And uh, one of them that I particularly concerned me was whether or not I shouldn't include uh, Roosevelt in this. Uh -huh. Because it wow. obviously played a significant part in the Second World War in, in Europe and contributed to the reshaping of Europe after the Second World War. Um, I thought about it and, and I decided in the end that I would, uh, I, I had to concentrate really on European mm -hmm. leaders. Um, and so my criterion was that they should be leaders of European leaders of government or of the state. Mm -hmm. And I just, well, if I then start including Pinochet or Roosevelt or anybody else for that matter, Mao Zedong and so on, the book will become, will become endless. It's big <laughs> I was going to say, you can save this for book two and three, but no, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, Europe has been the central, uh, format for a lot of this stuff in the shaping of the world, especially in the 20th century. And, uh, uh, everything that's gone on, uh, there, uh, what were some, uh, was there any stories or any things that you learned that you didn't know about that are in the book that we can tease out that you were, you were kind of surprised by, you were like, wow, I didn't know about that. Well, um, I, I worked on this stuff for a long time, so there was no sort of earth shattering thing that I thought I've never occurred to me before, but, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I did learn new things about, um, I think about each of the leaders. That I was dealing with, maybe not Hitler, but the other ones. I've got Hitler, I'd written specialized works on. Before. Oh, yeah. But on, on, on the yeah. others, I think I learned something new. But the one who, in, who I think I learned most about was Tito, since um, apart from giving lectures in universities, so I'd never done anything on Tito before. Mm -hmm. And I thought an intriguing character who um, fought, in, fought in, during World War II fought in as a war leader uh, and also a civil war leader because he was up against enemies within his, within his own state. And then his, his exploits as a war leader brought him to power in Yugoslavia. He almost single-handedly held that regime together for the next 30-odd uh, years. And when he died in 1980, the thing was already starting to crumble and then crumbled within 10 years of his death into this state where Yugoslavia ceased to exist and where the where it fell apart in, in, in warfare. So mm. his legacy was extremely short, but the shortness of his legacy demonstrates the importance of his, of his individual contribution to history. So I think probably I learned most uh, that was new about Tito. Is there something, as, as you wrote about these leaders, is there something that 
voters need to know or need to watch out for better? You you mentioned earlier on, uh, you know, the the personality, uh, the faux personality, the glorification personality, the the uh, the worshiping, the cult of personality sort of image that these people put on themselves. Yeah, do do you find that most of these leaders are narcissists? And then are there things that voters should watch out for? Yes, they are. Egocentrism, bordering on narcissism, is a is a characteristic characteristic feature of uh, practically all of these individuals. Even mm. even the ones in democracies have this element in their character. So that's absolutely right. And I think what should what voters today should really be look out for uh, of all is actually to be really extremely critical of everything that they read that political leaders say. Be right. actually critical and cynical about it and, and disbelieve most things that are said. And um, especially now in the age of um, fake news and social media, I think it's more than ever important that people um, are critical about the stuff that they read and uh, what politicians say, especially if they're offering what seem to be um, panacea solutions for really complex problems that we all face in our societies. Yeah, we saw that over here. Just inject bleach and everything will be fine. Uh, you know, the, the, it was crazy. You know, you, it, you, you, you really got to see what, what, what happens when um, uh, fascist sort of grift and corruption uh, are able to run rampant. Uh, is the, you know, as, as you study these folks, we have a lot of great journalists that come on the show. They've written books and, you know, they, they go to the white house and they, they interview, um, uh, you know, the press and everything over there. Um, is, is one of the big core elements really true for America that the press and the protection of the press that's given under our first amendment is one of the things that has kept us, has kept, uh, our, our thing, uh, uh, going as opposed to some of these other countries that you wrote about. Uh, the protection of, of the press and the freedom of speech are absolutely essential parts of, of a democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, where they start to become a problem is in the extremes of, of free speech, which, which you can find now in, the so in social media, which can be very yeah. harmful. So yeah. it's a, real, a moral question as to where then, if at all, you draw the line with free speech. Is any sort of speech permissible? Well, it isn't, is it? Even now, because we prevent certain forms of hate speech, even, even as we, as we speak. Um, and so, uh, we, that is really one of the big ethical problems of today's societies, I think, where we actually, um, draw the line, especially on social media, but, uh, but in us, free speech, as you quite rightly say, is, is pivotal to the, um, to the sort of power that a modern democracy has and has kept those modern democracies, uh, in business. Whereas if you look at when a dictatorship comes to power and authoritarian rule, the first thing they do is to block free speech and to prevent opponents of that regime from having their say. So free speech is absolutely essential as a basis of democracy. And in the protection of that in the constitution, you know, we, we saw the same sort of thing that I believe uh, Hitler was up to, or Goebbels was up to where we started getting called fake news and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. don't believe, don't trust what's, what's going on in the media. We've got, of course, some state media with Fox News and stuff. One thing that was interesting you brought up is how, you know, we should limit certain amounts of, of hate speech or certain amounts of really, there, there, there is a point where free speech is free and there's a point where we need to say, hey, we can't have that. And that's kind of an argument that's going on here in America uh, with the, uh, you know, the advent of Twitter, if you've been following that and how yeah. we, uh, you, Elon Musk has taken that over and he believes in free speech and that any should, anyone should be able to say anything. Um, and then when you study, and I'm sure you have with your study of Germany and Hitler, you know, over in Germany, you can't say certain things. You can't even raise your hand and, and, and do the, the Hitler sign. Uh, you know, they ban that, you know, there's free speech, but there's certain elements of hate speech that go too far. And one thing I was recently, and so this discussion has been going on in America, and I'm, I'm sure it plays into the study of what you wrote about. Uh, but I, I was exposed recently to this thing from Karl Popper, if you're familiar with him, The Paradox of Tolerance. And I thought it was interesting, and he talks about how unlimited tolerance can lead to the disappearance of tolerance, and that we need to have, as a tolerant society, we can have free speech, but we, we cannot tolerate the intolerant people. 
What, what, what are your, some, some of your thoughts on that from what you wrote about in the book? And does, do we need to have, does that need to be an important thing that we say, hey, it's great that we have free speech, but once we start being intolerant, once we start saying, you know, ugly things, you know, this person is the problem, that person is the problem, you know, we start, we start saying we, we can't have these people around, et cetera, et cetera, that, that becomes intolerant and dangerous. I think I think the question of where you draw the line in free speech has become one of the major ethical problems in in every uh, functioning liberal democracy today, and um, it, it it it's one which is very difficult to define in an abstract sense. But mm -hmm. we have to have you know, levels of intolerance towards the unspeakable, really, and we I, I think in practice we do that already. There are certain things that we wouldn't want to have um, said on, on whatever media in front of our children or grandchildren or something, certain things which we would draw the line at with personal attacks on other individuals, on minorities, on, on women, on ethnic minorities and so on. So we have that already implicit in our, in our own minds. The question is where you draw the line in any legislation on that. Mm -hmm. oh, you don't want to prevent people from speaking out and the freedom of speech, which as we just said, is, is absolutely essential for the functioning of a democracy. On the other hand, we can't have that giving rise to such intolerable, um, expressions that they are really then creating, destroying the very thing we want to preserve. So it is really a thorny issue, but one which the, the prevalence of, of, um, the, of social media, uh, is as, as give rise to in a way which didn't really exist. To anything like the same extent beforehand. Yeah. And we've learned that through, you know, what you've written about in the study of, of Europe, uh, Hitler, Mussolini, and other things that how dangerous this speech can be because it spreads and it infects. And, you know, we, we recently saw with Kanye West where he made some comments about Jewish people that were hate, hateful and anti Semitic. And within 24 hours, we saw people putting up hate speech against Jewish people on freeways. And so it, you, yeah. you see how immediately it spreads and infectious and it gives people license to be hateful. But I, I like the Karl Popper thing I, that I just recently was exposed to because I'm like, that seems to be the level of where, where when we say you're being intolerant of someone else and you want to destroy them or remove them, then that's probably a problem. In America, we've had yeah. this thing called cancel culture where almost any idea uh, or trying yes. to debate any ideas become... It, it deemed intolerable sometimes by our blue left wing class of the Democrats that I'm part of, uh, you know, they, they get shouted down at college. And I mean, there are certain elements that need for debate, but then there's certain times where you're just pointing at someone and going, I hate you. And here's some yeah. hate speech and stuff. Um, what, uh, what are, what are the lessons or tease outs do you think people will learn from the book? Uh, the lessons that well, sorry, right. That... Were there lessons or little tease out tidbits, any, any stories that you want to share from the book that entice people to go buy it? Well, I, I, I think you, you've hit upon a number of, a number of issues there, which, which arise from working on the 20th century, which have a different salience in the 21st century. There was no, there were no social media then, but they, what the, thank goodness, but the notion that I mean, what goals would have made of social media, I've got no way it would have been a, a help or even in certain ways, a handicap in other ways, I suppose. But then they, the monopoly control of the press then uh, highlighted some of the issues you've just been talking about. But what, what issues can we, uh, what, what points can we draw from this book about the 21st century? Well, um, I, I think I've already alluded to them. The need to be very careful and critical in uh, understanding, so in, in reading social media, using social media, both in terms of tolerance of speech, but also in terms of understanding the political messages which have been which have been uh, distributed through social media and it was bad enough when you had a a, a a normal print media that were telling lies and so on all the time but now with social media where as you just said an issue can be raised and then within within seconds or minutes of the latest then they can be spreading like wildfire on social media and it poses real problems for today's politicians and also as you say the the council culture, which has cropped the pond, as with us here in, in Britain too, mm -hmm. um, is really a, a very dangerous notion there that, um, that you, you have difficulties in expressing views, which, uh, which 
are um, rejected by some people and therefore they want to stop you set, expressing those views at all. On the other hand, there have to be certain things where you, again, you have to draw the line. We're back to the issue of free speech and what it means. Mm -hmm. And then you have politicians that use that as a weapon. They weaponize it and spread the lies around the world. Um, and there you go. Mark Twain, the famous quote, a lie can travel around the world and back again while the truth is lacing up its boots. Um, I think there's another version of that attributed to Churchill, but, uh, but it is Mark Twain. Uh, Winston Churchill, like it's halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on, is attributed to Churchill. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing how, well, how fast hate can spread on these social media forums, how fast lies can spread. You know, we've seen, we've seen, we've even seen gunmen that have gone and shot up places in terrorist activities and broadcast on social media. And there's, by the time the, the social media companies can, you know, stop it, squelch it, censor it so that, that, that sort of ugliness isn't shared, it's too late. It's already, it's already gone around the world a million times. Everyone's seen it and been exposed to it. And I think, I think your point is really important. We have to be each of us, the best arbitrators of history and what's come before us and understand what, 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 what the angles are. I mean, I, I grew up in religion. So to me, when you come at me with anything, I go, what's your angle? What are you, what are you, what are you selling? What are you, what's your motivation? What are we, what are we, what are we up to here? That's kind of how my whole build is with my brain. But most people don't have that. They, they seem to be more just open vessels of whatever politicians want to dump it in their brain, they go, okay. Well, people generally speaking want to have their, their own daily problems solved, don't they? And if, mm. if the debt problems are severe and, um, it seems as if our democratic society is not providing answers for those, those, um, daily problems that they face, then they will look for someone or something which does offer the, the seeming solution and mm. often Solutions are very simplistic ones, which don't, um, don't last the test of time and will then fade as soon as, uh, as soon as they, they, they come up against reality, but they are, they are, they attract large swathes of support, as you've just been saying through social media now in particular, but as you see from these, uh, historical examples that we've been talking about really in the case of, of, um, of the rise to power of the Nazi party in Germany, then even without social media. There was a possibility then of attracting large numbers of people by hate speech, by political hate speech, because the problems that people faced in their daily lives were acute and they wanted a solution. They were prepared then to trust that solution to Hitler with devastating, mm -hmm. to catastrophic effect. One of the most extraordinary things about Hitler was that a lot of the Nazi people knew what was going on. And one of the historians that we had come on, you, you probably have covered it. The German people would have the ash fall into their cities from the um, from from the uh, uh, Holocaust ovens, and they knew what was going on. They knew that was ash of of Jews, and they would they would keep the children home for the day. They would sweep it up, and and the that that that's just one thing that's always stuck with me when I heard about that. I was like, my God, the inhumanity and in, in the horror of of that. And I can't remember, they would call it a certain, there was a term they had for it when the ash would fall. But, but the, sorry, the, just a little bit careful about that though, because, um, um, the concentration camps were set up in Germany. They were meant to be known about, they were to, um, to, uh, incarcerate enemies of the state and so within Germany, the death camps, uh, were placed out in, um, in mainly in Poland. Oh. And, and so it, when Germany had conquered parts of Poland, of course, um, part the, uh, parts that were taken over by the Soviet Union. So, um, they, there were places that, uh, um, such as the, the, the town that comes to Auschwitz, where they were, they could not have been, but aware of, of the numbers of prisoners that were going to Auschwitz, but Auschwitz was a long way from somewhere like Cologne, for example. So, um, okay. when they from Cologne said they had no idea. The, what was going on in Auschwitz, they might have been telling the truth. They might not. It's difficult to know, of course, because after the war, people told a very, uh, apologetic stories about what was going on. But, uh, but it's also, um, it, we, we can't just presume that these death camps were necessarily widely known amongst the entirety of the German population. That's the only point. Yeah. Yeah. 
is the, the old saying by Dennis Miller: "No one finds Christ in on prom night in the back of the in the back of the car. Um, it's only when you've you know been found out as committing a crime that people you go, oh, well, no, I apologize. You know, the earlier your to your earlier point, you bring up that people want their daily problems solved. They want their they want you know." Uh, I, I'm always reminded by that scene from the movie Network where I just want my my Lazy Boy recliner and I want my TV and I want my beer and I want you to leave me alone. I want my radial tires. Just for the love of God, please give me some space, you know. Uh, and there there comes a point where people break. But, you know, we we just went through that moment as a, as a if you're if you're looking at what we're going through. You know, the Republicans were talking about pulling back from uh, Ukraine, the Ukraine. And our funding of it, uh, I'm sure that Putin was sitting there going, ha, ha. and we were sitting here as a democracy going, are people going to vote for the trains to run on time in a fascist government? Or are they going to say, we're going to tighten our belt, we're going to take some gas prices, we're going to take some inflation, and we're going to vote for the Constitution? And it appears that they largely did across the board. Yeah. Uh, the Republicans are stunned. And it was interesting to me that the day after, uh, Putin says he's retreating and has also been signaling, you know, negotiating and, you know, how much, whatever that is, you know, you can put stock in whatever, <laughs> but, but it was interesting to me that that was his announcement the day after. And I don't think it would have been the same announcement if things had gone with the huge red wave that we were anticipating, but it, it, it speaks to what you were saying, you know, uh, People, people will sometimes be willing to sell out their freedoms for, for uh, a good paycheck. Yes, well, um, so far anyway, it's been very heartening to see what um, solidarity there's been in Europe as well as in the Western world more generally um, in support of Ukraine. Uh, we, we are being put under a, some sort of test, aren't we, in every country with what people will tolerate in the mm. long run regard to energy prices and the rest of it. But so far, anyway, the resilience has been very strong and the readiness to support Ukraine. And as mm. you said, um, the implications for the war and for the outcome of the war remain to be seen. Let's, let's hope for the best in that. And at the minute, it's still impossible to say how this, will war, how this war will come to an end. But wars normally end through some sort of settlement or negotiated um, truce or peace. and. Um, I'll be surprised if this one doesn't end in the same way eventually. You know, I'm sure you wrote in the book about, or you've, you've, you've talked about in your prior books about how they had, they tried to appease Hitler by going, well, you know, give him, what was it? Czechoslovakia or Yugoslavia, or they, there was a, you know, initially with countries they're like, well, you know, uh, let him have that one. Just let him appease him. And as you mentioned earlier, we've done a very different approach with Ukraine where we've said, no, no Moss, no quarter. Um, we're not giving you that country. And we, we, we saw, and I believe there was data and intelligence that laid out that he, he intended to continue if he, if he took Ukraine. Yes, it, it's, it, yeah, I think the use of these, um, historical terms to, um, describe what's going on in today's world is sometimes a, a, a problem. And, um, uh, we, we see that uh, along the line that we're always very anxious. Say, is Putin and other Hitler? Is it the same as Hitler? Is it the same? Um, and, and it may be best just to say, well, we can. We history shows us how we've got where we are. History can show, to some extent, it can help us to understand where Putin is coming from and what his what his own views are on this and how he's going to proceed. But to to use jobs like appeasement uh, with regard to today's dealings with Putin might be misleading because after all, uh, we've just been talking about the differences between the 20th and 21st century when it comes to social media or media in general. But if we look at weapons, the obvious difference is that Putin has got nuclear weapons. <laughs> um, and so it seems to me that the, the line that the West has been taking, which is offering uh, a lot of support for, 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 um, for Zelensky and for Ukraine. Um, but falling short of, of, of any intervention within Russia itself, which might provoke a disastrous response, has been on the whole a very rational and sensible one. And I hope that we can keep that up and uh, signs that it's paying some, some dividends and let's hope that um, Ukraine prevails in this, in this war against Putin. But I think um, I'm just a little bit against these 
uh, anachronistic comparisons mm. of something happened in the 20th century. Let's just extrapolate from that and say, this is what we need to do today or what we don't need to do today. There you well, go. Different place there. There you go. Uh, what do you think about Italy? You've written about Mussolini. What do you think about Italy returning to Mussolini's party 50, what is it, 50, 70, 100 years later? Well, it, it, it's not exactly doing. Um, Giorgia Meloni has a neo fascist past. Everybody's aware of that. But she is now uh, taking over as the head of government in Italy. Um, she has some difficulty in forming a coalition. Uh, in itself, that may be a good thing to prevent some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm really pro-fascist tendencies from, from taking over. Um, governments in Italy tend to be uh, of short duration, but it may be that uh, Giorgio Maloney uh, is also able to form a government only of a brief duration. Mm. And then also Italy today, like Italy in Mussolini's time, is part of the European Union, which offers its own constraints on the exercise of power. Oh. So, you know, so, uh, I'm, I'm Georgia Maloney is now actually, uh, she was very anti European Union at one time, but she's now actually, um, backtracked a little bit on that and there's making compromises there too. So, um, it, it's, it, it's not, it's not a very, um, appealing, um, development in Italy. That's putting it very mildly and Georgia Maloney and her government can do some damage doubtless to a number of policies in, in Italy, but. I'm sort of slightly optimistic, nonetheless, that the democratic constraints will prevail and prevent her from, from, um, from, uh, entertaining particularly harmful policies. That's we, good. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we, I was just about to add that we, we have the example in, uh, in central Europe of Hungary, which claims to be an illiberal democracy mm -hmm. and very populist and, and some very unattractive tendencies indeed. And is a thorn in the side of the European Union. But I think with luck anyway, the Maloney experiment will come and go and no lasting or massive damage will have been incurred. But I, that's, that's my hope rather than, um, any, any pro prognosis. Yeah. I mean, Brazil and us, we just dodged a bullet by the thinnest of margins yeah. and, uh, hopefully we can maintain that. And, uh, I think the youth finally stepped in to vote which is important because it's yeah. their future. And, uh, they see things very differently than the older generation. My generation does a lot of my generation was still came up in that kind of racist era. And, and, uh, I, I washed myself of it years, decades ago, but it's like some, a lot of my other folks in my age range didn't. So there you go. Well, this has been very insightful. I really encourage people to read your book because the one thing man can learn from his history is that man never learns from his history. And thereby we just go round and round. That's uh, my favorite quote that I, I run off. Um, any, anything more you want to tease out or touch on about the book? Well, no, I'm very grateful for this chance to talk to you about it and talk about other things. And I have to say, as regards the midterm elections, that uh, I think Europeans in general, um, are very, um, very glad that the, the results came out in the direction that they did mm -hmm. and that, um, that offers good hope for our democracy in, in the USA. And that's the most important democracy in the world. So crucial that the American constitution survives and thrives and that democracy continues to be, um, uh, a model for the rest of the world and rather, rather than a possible, uh, a possible horror story. So I am cautious and optimistic now about the developments in America. There you go. What do you think about, uh, what's going on there? You know, where you guys have been using, uh. 10 Downing Street is an Airbnb. What's going on over there in Europe? Is that well, it's going to settle down or what? For sure is that, uh, that there won't be a chapter on any, any subsequent book, book on this trust. So, uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's been, uh, I mean, a political pantomime and, uh, on great, great political score, no doubt, but it's been our country that's been ruined in the process. That's the thing. Um, so, um, we, we need, we need some stability. We need some sensible grown up politicians to do some, uh, grown up things, I think, and get away from all this nonsense. There you go. There you go. Maybe, maybe the Brexit thing was a bad idea at this point. Maybe that's a, maybe that's the call. My view, not just at this point in my view, but, <laughs> but one thing, I mean, the, the deciding what are the, what are the negative consequences of Brexit have been, has been difficult to establish because since then we've had COVID, 
we've had over the pandemic and we've now had the war in Ukraine. So both of those had very negative impacts upon, upon British and European politics and economics. And so trying to decipher precisely from when that, what the impact of co of uh, Brexit has been, has been quite difficult, but I was a very staunch opponent of Brexit at the time it remains up to this day. Yeah. Well, it seems like a lot of the players are starting to fall out that, that were the proponents of it. They, they're starting to fail out and, and, uh, yeah. Hopefully, I mean, it's been, it's been a very bad few years, so hopefully we survived them, knock on wood. So it's been a big crisis there. in the last 15 years. There you go. Well, we want to give you more books you can write, so we'll make more history. How's that sound? Well, Ian, it's been uh, an honor to have you on the show, sir. We certainly appreciate you coming on and your insightful mind. I really encourage people to read the book. I learned so much from historians. I love reading history books, and we have, we've had a lot of historians on the show. And it's so important to understand what's going on in your world today and what politicians are up to, what power is up to, what leaders of business are up to, uh, you know, by studying the past, by studying leaders of the past and what they've done. Of course, you profiled uh, Churchill in my book, which is a big favorite of mine. Love Churchill. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for coming on, Ian. We really appreciate it. Great pleasure. I enjoyed talking to you. There you go. And uh, be sure to uh, order up the book, guys, wherever fine books are sold. Stay on those alley bookstores. They're a bit dangerous. But go wherever fine books are sold. Order up the book Personality and Power, Builders and Destroyers of Modern Europe by Ian Kershaw. Sir Ian Kershaw, that is, uh, to those of you in the British realm. Uh, and uh, thank you for coming by, everybody. We certainly appreciate it. Go to YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, all those crazy places we are on the internets. Be good to each other, stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time. And that should have us out.